So this is the Explore, uh, the Graduate Experience webinar. We are Arizona State University, IRA Fulton Schools of Engineering, um, located in the Phoenix metropolitan area. And we're hoping to have a whole lot of students. I think we probably have a combination of students that maybe have already applied to graduate programs at ASU for spring, maybe starting an application for fall. And uh, in addition to that, prospective students that just want to get more information uh, about our program. So, so welcome. At the end, um, uh, we will open it up for questions. We'd appreciate it if you use, use the Q&A feature as we do that. And uh, I'll go ahead and get started. My name is Mike McBride. I direct outreach and student recruitment in the IRA Fulton Schools of Engineering. We work out of the Dean's office in an area called Academic and uh, Student Affairs. Hi, I'm Pat Phelan. I'm a professor of mechanical engineering. I'm also the assistant dean for graduate programs in engineering. Welcome. Hi, everyone. I'm Nikki Chakshi. I'm the graduate recruitment advisor working with students coming in from India into graduate programs, um, and I'm based out of Bangalore, India. Welcome, everyone. So for those of you maybe that are joining us from the state of Arizona, this, this map's probably pretty easy for you to understand, but we do have probably a number of students from maybe even outside of the US or domestic students in other states. So you can see where, where we, we are located in the Southwest part uh, of the United States. We are in the fifth largest metropolitan area in, in the US. And if you could look uh, towards the bottom left hand side of the screen, you'll see that we have uh, four different campus locations within the metropolitan area of Phoenix. And um, uh, I, would, I would just preface this by saying that those four campus locations are um, all, all one university. So we're, we're, we're one university in many places in the Valley. Uh, we've expanded our footprint so we can offer a, enough programs and, and education for all the students that, that want it. Uh, but that said, um, you can kind of think about the campus locations as the, the next building over, I'd say. Everybody graduates with the same ASU or IRA Fulton Schools of Engineering Diploma. Everybody has the same ID card. We have shuttles that go back and forth between the different campus locations. Sometimes you, as a graduate student, may find yourself doing research on multiple campus locations. Uh, but um, we do offer, we positioned our, our uh, our engineering programs and technology programs on two of those four campus locations at the Tempe campus and then about 22 miles going east at the Polytechnic campus. And when you choose your academic program or the program you apply to, that sort of drives you to the location uh, where you'd be spending probably a vast majority of your time uh, completing, completing your, your degree. We've positioned our programs in what we call that East Valley corridor because many of our industry partners um, and governmental partners exist in that East Valley area. So all those great companies you hear about in the news, industry partners like, like Intel and Boeing and, and Honeywell um, have, a, have a lot of space in that East Valley. So it gives us and our students some great opportunities to connect with um, um, internships um, and, and, and obviously jobs after, after graduation. So that. So again, I did mention that we are the fifth largest metropolitan area in the country. One of the unique things about uh, that too is that there aren't really any other higher education research institutions in that metro area. And that's one of the reasons why we've expanded our footprint uh, in the Valley. So, so in terms of, again, connection to internships and jobs are really, really good that way. You're not really competing with other institutions locally uh, for those opportunities and, and, and research is, is a great, great way to do that. You can see we're, 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 we're really moving fast in terms of attracting new industry um, within the Phoenix metropolitan area. If you're reading the news these days, you hear like, like Intel is, is expanding by 20 to $25 billion right now out in the uh, East Valley. Go a little bit further down to Casa Grande, Lucid is opening a new manufacturing plant. This is, this is uh, and also Nikola. Uh, so electric vehicle uh, momentum is really happening in, in, in the Phoenix metropolitan area. So some great things, some great opportunities, and a lot of it is happening in, in the space of engineering and technology. All right. Thanks, Mike. I'll take the next few slides. So something we want to emphasize, and, and you probably already know this, that ASU is a very large university, and in particular, 
the College of Engineering at ASU is also very large. And in fact, we now have the most engineering graduates among all universities in the United States. And you can see we're in very good company. We just barely beat out Georgia Tech. And we're also ahead of Purdue, Texas A&M, and the University of Illinois. So we're, like I said, in very good company. Even though we're very large, as are these other universities, we still are very much believers in high quality education. And we try to get the best students as well. So our programs are organized in kind of a unique way. And so we now have seven schools in our schools of engineering. So for example, this is I know is, is rather confusing. My program, Mechanical Engineering, as I mentioned, is in the School for Engineering of Matter, Transport, and Energy. But in, within this one school, we have not only mechanical engineering, we have aerospace engineering, we have chemical engineering, we've got modern energy production and sustainable use. So in other words, we have several related programs all in one school. And that philosophy is basically so that these programs can learn from one another. So in other words, it makes it much easier now to take courses, for example, from other programs within your same school. From a research point of view, maybe you get a chance to work with students or faculty from another related program, again, within the same school. Now, it's not to say you have to work with others within the same school, but it just makes it that much easier. Another important school, uh, well, they're all important, but another particularly large school is the School of Computing and Augmented Intelligence, or SCAI. And this includes our very popular programs such as computer science, software engineering. Another program that spans several schools is our master's degree in robotics and autonomous systems, which currently has concentrations in five of these seven schools. And finally, I'd like to highlight one of our newest programs. We have a PhD in data science, analytics and engineering. And again, that's in the School of Computing and Augmented Intelligence. So this is a quick shot of all the graduate programs that we have. And of course, this is always being added to, mind you. Uh, and so this will quickly become out of date very soon. But it gives you an idea of the breadth of programs, both at the master's level as well as at the PhD level. So I think there's a program for you uh, you know, you can find something that's going to work for you somewhere in our degree programs. Okay, now something you might have heard is that ASU is number one in the United States in innovation. And that's the recognition from US News and World Report. And by the way, that's the seventh year in a row. And in fact, ever since that ranking was started, we've held that number one spot. Uh, something that we're very, very proud of. And so why do we keep on being considered the number one university in the United States for innovation? Well, I already mentioned something about new degree programs. We develop programs that are in demand. And so, so for example, we have a new certificate in semiconductor processing. And Mike mentioned how Intel is expanding here in the Phoenix area. And they're not the only ones. Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation, TSMC, they are also building a very large fab here in the Phoenix metropolitan area. I mentioned another new degree that's called Modern Energy Production and Sustainable Use. This is a new master's degree program that focuses on sustainable energy. In the middle, we talk about the ASU Innovation Open. So this is an entrepreneurial competition. We'll talk more about these kinds of opportunities, but we have a lot of students engaged in entrepreneurship. And finally, on the right-hand side, we have the drone studio. This is the largest indoor drone studio in academia, in other words, within the uh, universities. And so this is a relatively new facility. And of course, this also complements our master's degree in robotics and autonomous systems, as well as a number of other related programs. OK. Here's a quick snapshot, all sorts of stats. Uh, I'm not going to go over all these, of course, but it just gives you an idea about the various things that are going on. And you know, one of the most important ones is down there at the lower right-hand corner, 72,000 plus alumni. And of course, that number grows up by thousands every year. And this is actually really important. All right. So, you know, as you probably know, a lot of times, you know, landing that right job, sometimes it means that you know, perhaps you know somebody there. 
at that company already. And sometimes that means you know an alum, right? Someone else who graduated from ASU. So having a large and growing alumni base can be very, very important. So speaking of jobs, we're all interested in, in our students, our graduates landing good jobs after they graduate. And so here are some recent graduate degree career outcomes. And by the way, this is both master's as well as PhD level students. And you can see this is taken from students who graduated in the 2019-2020 academic year. So a few facts. All right, 82% uh, of these graduates received an offer within 90 days of graduation. And uh, all those remaining 18%, 6% actually went on to another graduate program. The medium full-time starting salary, very impressive, $97,000. Below that, 50%, 57% of our students, while they were still students, participated either in teaching, field experience, or internships. Now, where do these students go upon graduation from engineering? You can see our top industries, of course, internet and software. Electronics, we've already talked about Intel, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation, and so forth. Higher education, meaning going on to other grad school. Construction is a huge area for us as well. And the featured employers down there at the bottom, you'll see some very well-known names there, maybe some that are less well-known, but all of these companies are looking to hire our students. And finally, they do end up in various places around the US and even uh, in, you know, outside of the US. So, about 37% of our graduates stay here in Arizona, but fully 23% go on to California, such as Silicon Valley or, or other, other places within the state. So what are some of the, the resources that are available to our students? So we have research experiences, and we're gonna talk more about both of these, but one is aimed at current master students. The other, the summer research internships is aimed at students who want to pursue graduate school in the future. Next, we have our own career center here in engineering, which includes now a career fair just for graduate students every semester. Finally, we have entrepreneurial mindset and what we call beyond the classroom. So entrepreneurship is a huge thing here at ASU and certainly for our engineering students as well. We have what's called the Fulton Graduate Entrepreneurship Program. We have a number of competitions where you can get not only money, all right, as well, but you can also find some mentors as well as some space from which you can develop your product. Beyond the classroom means everything else. So such as EPICS, the engineering projects and community service, as well as additional design experiences. A lot of our students participate in internships. And so if you include not only internships, but also various kinds of other experiences, such as student teaching or field experience and so forth, fully 57% of our students participate in some way. And for international students, this is, I think, also something that's quite important. Our CPT options, curricular practical training options, are fully described at this website here. So if you're, if you're thinking about, if you're an international student and you're thinking, well, I'd like to do an internship, but I, I don't know the procedure for how to you know, get that approval, please visit this website here. And it depends upon your program. They're all a little bit different, um, but you can figure out how to do that once you're here at ASU. So now I'm going to switch over to Nikki. Thank you, Pat, I appreciate it. So now let's discuss a little bit more about how to build a competitive application. So when you start your online application, asu.edu slash apply, there are several different items that would constitute an application that is considered to be a complete application. So firstly, you have your statement of purpose. This is essentially your a personal statement that you would write to essentially discuss your goals, um, the purpose as to why you would like to pursue this particular program, not only at ASU, but um, what you hope to achieve out of it, maybe professional goals, career goals, and of course, academically, how would this program fit into your career trajectory? In addition to that, there's also a space in the online application that allows you to submit a resume. Now, it's important to understand that 
when you're an international student, when you're a domestic student, um, the admissions committee, regardless of which department you're applying to, is maybe sitting on the other side of the world and has not met you in person. So it is wise to actually utilize all this real estate, this precious real estate well. So the advice I have for students is not to repeat the exact same information verbatim that you do on your resume as you write in your statement of purpose. Um, the resume can highlight different strengths you have different types of professional work experience, leadership experience, any sort of research that you have conducted, um, et cetera, right? So it's in, we highly encourage you to submit that resume as well because every single document that a student submits that is a part of the application uh, does go into review and is taken into consideration by the admissions committee. Uh, transcripts are also required to be submitted as a part of the application, and you're able to upload the unofficial copy of your transcript. Um, this uh, is uploaded directly in one PDF file uh, straight into the online application. And if a student is admitted to the program, then you are required to provide uh, the official uh, hard copies of your transcripts before the start of your program. Now, test scores, and we'll talk about GRE in the next slide, but in terms of English proficiency, um, if you are not a citizen of the US, we do require that if you are coming from a non-English speaking country, that you provide some proof of English proficiency by um, either the TOEFL, the IELTS or the Duolingo. And there's also a um, provision for requesting an English proficiency waiver if you have successfully completed your com entire bachelor's degree um, in an English medium. So if you're able to provide us with proof of that, then we're able to consider your English proficiency waiver as proof of English proficiency. Um, certain programs, will also require letters of recommendation. This varies from anywhere from one letter all the way to three letters. However, if the program does not require letters of recommendation, the online application will not have uh, an, an entry point where you can actually enter your recommender's email addresses and contact name. Um, if your program does require LORs, for example, the online application will provide you a, a space to enter the information of your recommenders. And as soon as you submit that online application, the system sends out an email to your recommender requesting for that recommendation. Um, again, you're welcome to reach out to us um, as well if you have certain questions about this. But Pat, if we can go to the, the next slide. Regarding the GRE, uh, many programs at the Ira Fulton Schools of Engineering are providing GRE waivers where the GRE is either optional or waived for a certain semester. Now, this might vary from semester to semester. It might be different for spring 2022 versus fall 2022. Uh, it is ultimately the academic department to which you're applying to uh, that uh, decides on these GRE waivers, right? So the best space to find this information is the link that you see in front of you. Uh, this link will provide you information on all the different programs that Pat has dis discussed earlier in this session. And if you do not clearly see or are unable to find if there is a GRE waiver, for example, we're always happy to receive your you know, emails at the, the departmental level and the department can then let you know uh, whether yes, there is a waiver or no, that the GRE is still required. All right, thank you very much. So, um, of course, something of, of great interest to almost all students, right, is, is how do I support myself for my graduate studies? And so, you know, typically graduate students consider three different options, all right? One would be TA or RA positions. And I'll talk about that on the next slide. That's teaching assistantships and research assistantships. Another is fellowships. And sometimes these are ASU fellowships. Sometimes these are external fellowships. And lastly, we also have on-campus jobs. So all students are able to work up to 20 hours per week on campus during the academic semesters. And, but you know, that can actually go to full-time, 40 hours a week during the summers and the winter break. So let's talk about some of these options. So first of all, teaching and research assistantships, or TAs, RAs. So let's start with teaching assistantships. Of course, you know, this means helping a professor in the classroom. Sometimes it means uh, holding a laboratory section or perhaps a recitation section for a more theoretical class. 
these funding, uh, the decisions are made by the academic program. So for example, my own program, mechanical engineering, mechanical engineering decides who to support as a TA. So it's not really up to an individual faculty member, but rather it's up to the program. There are some hourly positions, but there are also positions where the tuition is covered as well. But it is important to note that most TAs are awarded to PhD students, not to master's students. So again, mostly TAs go to PhD level students. And on top of TAs, we also have RAs, research assistantships. Now this, of course, as the name suggests, is all about research. So now it means you're supporting a individual professor or a group of professors in a research project. And in fact, as a professor, we write lots and lots of proposals to fund research. And most of that funding, if we get it, goes to support graduate students. But again, most RAs go to PhD level students. That's not to say that none go to master's level students, but the vast majority go to PhD level students. Fellowships. We do have a variety of, of ASU fellowships that we offer. And in fact, this is done through a competitive process. You can apply for a fellowship once you've been admitted into one of our graduate programs. Our online fellowship portal will open on February 1st next year for students admitted for the fall 2022 semester. So all students get the opportunity to apply for a fellowship. Um, these fellowships though, for the most part, are relatively small. So we're talking, usually it's, it's on the order of $1,000 to perhaps $5,000 at most. We do have a few fellowship programs that I'll talk about next that are more comprehensive. But you can see in the 2019-2020 year, we, we awarded about 300 fellowships just in engineering. If you're a PhD student, or if you're thinking about a PhD student, then it's good to know, you know what, what's, what are funding opportunities particular to PhD level students. On the left-hand side, we have our Dean's Fellowships Program. And so th this is a very prestigious program. It is limited though to domestic US students. So in other words, either US citizens or permanent residents. And so this provides full support for four academic years for PhD level students. In the center, we have Fulton Fellowship. So this is a pot of money uh, that is distributed to each of the schools and each school makes up its own determination about who is going to receive these fellowships. These award sizes, relatively small, between $1,000, $5,000. These are a one-time award for new incoming students. And again, you can apply to be considered for a Fulton Fellowship through that Fulton Fellowship portal. Finally, we have what are called block grants. And so these again are meant to enable better recruiting of PhD students, both domestic as well as international. These fellowships are not applied for rather, but are determined by nomination from the individual programs. External fellowships. We encourage all of our students to seek funding wherever they can, there, wherever they can get it. And so it turns out there are lots of, of, of sources of support for various kinds of students. And you can see the variety here shown on the left-hand side. Please go to our website, the one shown up above, and that'll give you an idea of these various kinds of external fellowships for which you might be applicable. Something we mentioned briefly earlier for our current master's students. In other words, once you've started a master's degree program here at ASU, we have what's called the master's opportunity for research and engineering or the MORE program. What this means is that together with a professor, so together with a faculty member, you're gonna write a short proposal. And so if that proposal gets funded, that will provide a stipend of $1,500 per semester for you, uh, some additional funds, $400 in materials and supplies, and also travel funds to enable you to present that work later at a conference. And on the right-hand side, we're showing some examples of various kinds of projects that were supported by this MORE program. We have a competition both in the fall semester as well as in the spring semester. And so about 60 projects per year are funded. On-campus jobs. So this, I'm gonna ask my colleague, Mike, to take over. 
Yeah, we have uh, all kinds of uh, on-campus job opportunities to take advantage of. And uh, so, so we have, a, first of all, a student employment uh, website where you actually can find out what jobs are open. A lot of these uh, jobs, as you may imagine, open up just at the start of a semester, whether that be a spring or a fall. So oftentimes, in conjunction with that website, we'll hold very large student employment uh, affairs for both undergraduate and graduate students to participate in. And and, um, and so students will apply for those jobs. I, I can tell you like a great example would be in our Dean's office, we have a, a substantial data analytics group and they have uh, several uh, graduate uh, student, student workers that do data analytics on behalf of the Dean's office. And, uh, but then, you know, we're, we're the largest schools of engineering in the country. And you can imagine that, that uh, we need support in a lot of different ways, not just with full-time staff, but with students. So a lot of opportunities, both for uh, domestic and international students to, to, uh, to have job opportunities. And this will give you an example of what, what the pay scale is currently. Um, you know, and what I oftentimes will tell students, you know, sometimes you may be able to find an off campus job that pays a, a little bit more. Um, but I can tell you that when you're working in a university uh, job, and maybe many of you that have finished undergraduate degrees have already done student employment, and, and you know this, it makes it so much easier to stay on campus working with folks that are supporting your education and, and know what you need to do at certain times of the semester. Uh, so they're a little more flexible with you in terms of, 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 of when you uh, complete those hours during the course of the week. And then um, ultimately uh, these folks also can act perhaps as a, a reference for you for your first job or maybe to move on to a PhD program if you're in a master's uh, area. So, so, uh, so, so again, 20 hours a week on employment. And then as Pat said, 40 hours a week in the summertime. So, so a great opportunity in many different ways for you in student employment. Okay, so another opportunity that we mentioned briefly is our Surrey program. This stands for Summer Research Internships Program. And the what this is, is, is we're looking for students to come during the summertime and participate in research under the guidance of one of our faculty members. And this, we've run this program now three times. So for the last three summers. So the very first summer, it was all residential. In other words, all the participating students came to ASU and stayed on campus. But you know, as you probably know, the last couple of years have been a little bit rough in that regard. And so we've conducted this program entirely virtually the last two years. And we've had a lot of students participate. Last summer, we had more than 70 students participate, of which about 40 or 45 were international students. And so that means that we're able to engage a lot of, of potential graduate students in this program. So we are rolling this out next summer as well. We hope to have both in-person program as well as a virtual program. So in other words, it will likely be a hybrid type opportunity. Um, for domestic students, we're able to offer some support, some, some financial support for qualified domestic students. International students will have to pay some amount of money to participate in person. So in other words, if you want to come to ASU and stay here for about eight weeks during the summer, work in a faculty's laboratory and, and participate in other activities during the summer, there will be some charge for that. Um, to participate virtually, that charge is gonna be much, much less. And so you'll be able to see a lot more details at that website shown on the bottom left-hand corner. And so we're, we're still kind of developing the details for next summer's program. So please go back and revisit that as needed. Okay, this is us about ready to wrap up. And so we're gonna hold a number of these webinars. They're gonna hold, you know, they're gonna be covering different topics as you can see. And so we encourage you to, to visit us again and again. And so our recorded webinars are all going to be available at that website shown there. And so with that, I want to emphasize that if you have any follow-up questions that you don't want to ask here, please email us at fultonschools at asu.edu. And again, fultonschools at asu.edu. We will answer your email, trust me. And so with that, we'd like to go to our q and A. I'm going to stop sharing here briefly and so that I can bring up our questions and answers and I'll share my screen again here.
Okay, so we're just gonna take these questions one by one. And if anybody else has a question, by all means, please type it into the questions and answers. First question, can someone with no bachelor's in computer science apply for the PhD in data analytics? I have a bachelor's in double E and four years of experience in data science. I guess I'll take that one. The answer is yes, you may. And so the, this new degree is really meant to encourage students from a variety of backgrounds. So not only in computer science, but also in industrial engineering in particular, but there are other students as well. I understand, you know, just like you have in electrical engineering, there is a lot of data science going on, especially in electrical engineering. And that's true here too, by the way. And in our PhD in data science, analytics, and engineering program, we have a lot of double E faculty participating as well. So the answer is very much yes, you are qualified. And I would encourage you to apply for that program. All right. Next question. Interest in pursuing research computer vision. My question is, would contacting potential advisors in advance be beneficial to my application or does the admission committee advise against it? Thank you again. Well, thank you for your question. So I'll take this one as well. And, you know, as a, you know, I can speak from personal experience, you know, and, and I can imagine in my colleagues in computer science, it's even much more so, but we get lots and lots of emails from prospective students. And so, you know, I, I would say that probably it, it's not worth it to contact professors before you apply, all right? Because we get just so many of those and it's really hard to figure out, you know, who's serious, who's a really competitive student or not. And so I think you're better off first applying, okay? And, and that way, you know, you're, you're showing that, yeah, you're serious about this, okay? Then if you want to reach out to prospective uh, uh, faculty advisors, go ahead. But, you know, recognize that again, you know, even we, we get lots and lots of emails, right? And so you may not get a response. And if you don't get a response, don't feel bad, okay? Um, you know, the, the better tried and true way to really impress a faculty member is to take their class, <laughs> do well in it, all right? Uh, you know, talk to that professor, show up at their office hours, you know, in other words, get them to remember you, you know, stand out somehow from the crowd. That's really how you impress a, a professor. And, you know, it, it's a lot harder to do that from long distance and it's no fault of yours, but it's just a lot harder to do that from a distance. And so really, once you get here, take their classes, you know, do well, and again, stand out in some way. Thanks again for that question. We have another question. Are the requirements to get into the MSCS and MCS programs the same? Nikki, do you want to take that? Sure, Pat. That's a so that is a great question. Um, you will see on the website that the, the information that is listed on what we call the landing page for the MSCS and MCS programs um, might also include what we have as the MCS online. So if the question is regarding is the GRE required for the MSCS or MCS programs and the answer is Yes, the GRE is required for those programs uh, because they fall under the same um, internal program code as the online program, which does not uh, may not require that uh, you know GRE requirement. So again, on the GRE side, that's how that program works. Now, there is a thesis track and a non-thesis track. And Pat, you spoke a little bit about this earlier in the presentation, but by default, students are usually admitted to the non uh, sorry to the non thesis track simply because in order to be on that thesis track you would need to find a faculty advisor which would typically only take place once you have arrived on campus uh, once you have started working on your classes um, maintained an academic uh, you know good academic average met with faculty members etc uh, pat is there anything else that you'd like to add in terms of the non thesis and thesis tracks um, you know, and this is a great topic, uh, you know, in general, you know, students come to us at the master's level, you know, some are interested in doing a thesis, some are not, right? And there's advantages and disadvantages of each approach. And, but, you know, one important thing is if you're interested to do a thesis, you have to connect with a faculty member. So in other words, you have to get a professor to agree to serve as your thesis advisor. 
And once that happens, even if you're on a non-thesis track, you can switch to the thesis option, all right? So that happens all the time because um, most students are admitted to the master's programs in the non-thesis track by default, okay? So don't feel bad if you're admitted to a non-thesis track program because again, if you're interested in doing a thesis, once you connect with a faculty member and that person agrees to serve as your advisor, you can easily switch to the thesis option. Thanks, Pat. And I don't believe we have other questions. So if anybody else has questions, please do let us know uh, using the Q&A function. I'd like to emphasize again, if you have questions after this webinar, please direct them to that email address you see on your screen, fultonschools at asu.edu. I might add that on Thursday, if anybody happens to be joining us today that uh, is, is already admitted or maybe applied and you're interested in talking with an academic advisor in, in your discipline, we're gonna have a number of academic advisors talking about next steps, registration uh, for spring semester of 2022. Um, and, and they can also answer questions about their process for admission. All right, another question. Could you give us an example of a previous Surrey project? Great question, all right? So in, um, I'll, how about for my own group? I'll, I'll give a, an example of that. So let's see. Um, so I had some students, um, I had, a, for instance, some students from, from India, for example, okay? And so they worked on an analysis of a solar-driven cooling system. And in particular, they were working to design this system um, using an AI approach. And so this project was done in collaboration with a professor at the Valor Institute of Technology. And so one of the nice things about that particular project and, and about Surrey projects in general is a lot of times it does end up being a collaboration of some sort. And so in this case, it was an international collaboration. We had uh, two students, I believe both from, I want to say computer science, who worked on this project and especially under the supervision of the professor from VIT. So that's one. So, so if it's a project that's done virtually, of course, that means it's some kind of a simulation or modeling type of project, right? Um, if it's a project done locally, for instance, I had a, another student, a, a local domestic student work on a Surrey project last summer where they conducted experiments about various kinds of radiant cooling surfaces. So in other words, how can we cool buildings and surfaces more effectively by their surface? And so that was an experimental project, in fact, done in collaboration with a local entrepreneur here. Great question. All right, I think we have no more questions. So with that, let's bring this to an end. Thank you all very much for attending. Like Mike said, we'll have a lot of additional webinars, including this Thursday, where you'll get to speak with some of our advisors. Any final words from Mike or Nikki? I don't think so. Just for, thank you very much for joining us. And thank you, Pat and Nikki. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you at the next webinar.